So go ahead, Caleb. Thank you. Okay. I mean, oh, I see that you've got the recording light on now, so I I'm do. good to go. Okay. I am Caleb Crow, and I don't usually spend a lot of time talking about myself other than just telling you guys how I've traveled the, the state. Um, I, I was born in the Austin area, and my father lived here, and he was uh, involved with Armadillo World Headquarters, if, if anybody's heard of that. So, you know, this year has been a strange year. We lost uh, Jerry Jeff Walker and, uh, and many others. So it was um, kind of hard on me growing up in the in the Austin and Texas music scene. Um, I lived on tour until I was like 10 or so, and then I moved in with a grandparent so that I could stably go to elementary school and everything. And that's when I moved to Richardson. So grew up all, all through Texas and did college in Texas. But um, I got into energy uh, early on as an electrical engineer and promptly wanted to do something that was uh, with the environment too. So my background started in renewable energy and then energy efficiency and kind of weatherization practices in buildings. And from there, uh, started doing sustainability broadly in climate work. So I did climate research with Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. If anybody's heard of her, I, um, I hope everybody's heard of her. <laughs> She's a Nobel laureate from, uh, from writing the fifth assessment report for for how we're doing in, in the climate world. But more importantly, she's a UN champion of the earth. She's Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People a few years ago. She's won every award there is to win. And um, I don't know, maybe don't listen to me and, and, and go listen to some of her TED Talks. I think she's uh, really impressive. Now, uh, we're seeing admin screen. That's probably not our <laughs> intent, intended uh, presentation. Okay, I'll go ahead and do the screen share and maybe that won't happen again. Okay, should be seeing at least my title slide now. And I, I put all these post nominals <laughs> by my name. I mean, it's ridiculous, but in sustainability, right? Uh, I'm a lead AP, which is an accredited professional. I'm gonna talk about lead a lot today. Uh, and, and then I'm also an eco districts AP, which is kind of a newer, broader uh, certification. Uh, I do a lot of construction work for, and that's why I have I'm OSHA's 30 construction safety. And of course I have a master's in public administration. So I put the MPA on there, but really, I'm only going to talk about Austin Community College District and our projects today. So the energy conservation manager is my title. I'm also an adjunct professor in government. And so I kind of wear a lot of hats, but I'm going to talk mostly about what we do energy wise today. The description that went out is this, and I'm not going to read it to you, but I added some emphasis there because at ACC really, I interface with operations and security a lot. Um, and then I'm in facilities. So my, my role in, in the Energy and Sustainability Office is in, is in our facilities department. And the way ACC has labeled its, um, its department's operations kind of maintains the existing spaces and facilities uh, creates the new ones. So all the project managers and architects and people who do interior design are all in facilities with me and it's kind of an odd fit because normally an energy manager would work uh, in operations and, and th there's obviously some organizational uh, battling that goes on from time to time i tend to work with electricians and hvac kind of people uh, as much or if not more than i work with my own department and facilities and because we're talking about lighting i think security is, is going to be uh, paramount as we uh, you probably all know that. So I don't have a set. This is what the board has approved at ACC. And this is what we do with regard to dark sky, right? So I'm calling them working standards because I kind of know what I want to implement. I have a goal going in, but I think no one else <laughs> really does. And, and it's very difficult for me to enforce anything that I'm gonna say, right? The project managers could do something totally different or operations can do whatever they want. I, I don't have any, I don't have the teeth of like a board approved 
written standard. So that's kind of my goal and where I'll, I'll culminate this talk. Um, I tend to focus on you know, student safety and at ACC, absolutely everything is about equity. And then um, my core job is energy savings. So these are gonna be my motivations as I walk through what it is that we do. I'm gonna to try to talk for, I don't know, 20 minutes to not be terribly boring, and then hopefully we can have some, some discussion and follow on. For those of you that don't know, and there's a, a great uh, coverage of the state here, uh, so maybe nobody really knows about Austin Community College, but we're huge. Our, our tax basis is larger than the state of New Jersey, and we have different campuses that are spread out across all these counties. And uh, I, I go to all of them. They're, they're all under my purview as, as energy manager for the district. So every building and uh, theoretically all those students, faculty, and staff are in, in buildings that I am managing energy and water and, and other kind of resources for. So what I was gonna focus on is my energy strategy, how it, uh, how it corresponds and affects dark sky. So I'm gonna talk about LEED. I'm not really gonna talk about the energy, renewable energy portfolio, though we do have a megawatt of rooftop solar. We've just committed to 100% solar uh, purchased power. So you could say ACC is 100% solar. Um, we don't have, it's not all self-generated, right? But, but then, um, I also do a lot with trying to save money on the cooling side, and uh, finally, I think we're we're really going to focus here is this lighting schedules and efficiency upgrades. So, uh, so these are the ones that I think overlap, and I'm just going to jump right in with this is my agenda. So, lead right now is in lead 4.1, and it has this this single point right, light pollution reduction. So. We can pretty much go for this in anything we do. And right, we have over 40 buildings. And to give you a sense, I've been here four years. I think I've built six new buildings. And our master plan for the district in, includes, I don't know, 20, 20 more. I mean, we have a whole new property, and that one property alone, I think, has eight buildings that are going to be erected on it out by the airport here. So we build a lot. We're we're growing and we're still expanding, kind of in all in all directions uh, as Austin continues to expand. And we have all kinds of partnerships that are happening with Tesla, with the Army Forward Command, and and um, our buildings are not necessarily a one function. Like you might think of us as an education institution, but on my first day when I started here four years ago. Uh, I was sat down and they said, hey, can you build us a lead uh, gun range? And I thought, well, these guys don't know I'm native Texan. They're trying to pull some kind of prank on me. And, and yeah, all right, okay, we'll build a gun range. No, they were serious. We, we ended up building uh, the second lead certified gun range in the, in the United States. Um, the other one's on an Air Force base. So it was a, it's a great thing. And it's down in Hayes. It's in Hayes Town. Uh, so... In all of these buildings, uh, we have a lead silver standard. And what that means is we shoot for, for lead silver. There's certified silver, gold, and, and platinum. We have a few golds. We have no platinums. I've never actually been involved in a, in a platinum build. And since we have lead silver as our minimum, of course, we have a lot of, of lead silver buildings. And everything we build has to start there. To get lead silver, I'll go through the points, um, totals in a second. but on the way you collect these points for how you build your building and one of them is is this light pollution reduction and i've cut a little excerpt here uh i don't intend for anybody to to read and learn this but hopefully you guys already already know it uh, i do like the the intent language there and and how it matches so well with ida's purpose too the thing is, it's, it's actually a pretty challenging point to get because I'm gonna go through the, the instructions on it and it uses some very complex language, what I expect to be overly complex. I mean, this lighting zone is completely nonsensical. How do you know if you're LZO, LZO, right? You have to look it up is the answer. Like people don't, especially people that are new to a project, they're not gonna know, uh, they're not gonna know that. And then, then they're also not gonna know this this uplight rating right that that's a reference to so you have these 
multiple points of reference and a, a triple point of reference here. You got to go consult these addendums. So it's not understandable to someone who's just sitting down for the first time just to start to work through this. And then it's really complex, right? Because you've got, well, you can use option one or you can use option two. And, you know, you've got this light trespass. Well, that also has an option one. And, and then it also has an option two. <laughs> and so everything that you do uh, has these kind of forking flow chart ways of trying to figure out how am I going to get this point? What tends to happen in that case is, oh, and then there's a third one. There's a third and that we have to do. Um, and none of it is something that someone could sit down and and read so and when i say someone i'm really thinking about the construction team right you've got a, a general contractor who's got a, the owner's rep who's probably an architect or a program manager that person is most likely to have experience with this especially if they work for us and then the the third person is going to be probably this lead consultant that's going to be hired on the project and hopefully the lead consultant will have worked through this before or will have someone in their office on their team that has because it's really something you kind of need to be experienced with or you have to have someone else on the construction team to do the accounting work to figure out well, what did we purchase did we purchase these i'll walk it back did, did, did we purchase the these backlight ratings uh did, did what percentage are we in you know what's our what's our uplight rating and, and who's tracking that so someone that's buying fixtures for all the projects the you know on our exterior I mean, I don't know, hundreds of, of fixtures that somebody's got to gotta watch, and calculate, and, and just maintain internally a spreadsheet. So my experience, you know, it's, it's overly complex. And what that tends to mean is you pass on it, right? Like, there's not a lot of motivation to get a single point, right? Even to get, so we're, we're going for lead silver as a minimum. So we're always getting at least 50 points. And... Uh, is one of those <laughs> going to be this fairly arduous uh, point? Um, some people are going to kick it out just because it's difficult. I mean, um, in contrast, there are many points where you can just pay a few thousand extra dollars and, and get, get something clean, get something uh, flushed out, or, or make sure you've got um, the right now number of recycled content, or you know, the, there are easier points to get. Is, is all I'm saying. So even if we do get these projects to go for it, uh, we never repeat the same team in the next project. So we start all over again with the same battle the next time I go into a, a new building project. I've got a new general contractor. ACC will n almost never repeat general contractors. And even if we did repeat the same company, it would probably be a different project manager within that company. And then I'm typically moving on to another project manager, even within ACC. I mean, we have, I want to say we have about a dozen project managers, so it could be any one of them. It's a lot of people to all get trained up onto just this one kind of minor point. And then it'll also be a new lead consultant that, uh, that manages it, and they'll have their own kind of set opinion about this is how you get silver, you get these points. And, and we sort of have to steer them around to our way of thinking. So, you know, inevitably it's going to be, well, isn't, isn't there an easier point? Let's, let's, what happens in a lead meeting for those of you that haven't been there is they say, well, let's put it in the maybes and we'll circle back to it. <laughs> but it's not really a point that you can do that, right? Because if you buy a wrong fixture, you, you lost it. So that's the, the third problem that here. Like uh, you have to like really plan for it at the beginning and then do it all the way through and do it right <laughs> so that you don't just lose the, you know, wasted effort, you know, uh, buy the wrong thing or, uh, and I haven't even added the, sometimes you have to fight with the architect, not, not our internal architect, the project manager, but the building has another architectural firm and that architect may want different kind of lights too. So there are battles that have to be won here to, to get this. Now, does that mean we don't do it? Of course not. The only building I have in my queue right now that's using this current uh, 4.1 is this Highland Campus Building 3000. And uh, just for those of you that haven't seen the page, this little circle says, yes, we put in the yes column, the light pollution protection. So, so we have done it for uh, this building. And, you know, fingers crossed, we'll, we'll get a gold rating on this building. That would be really awesome. I don't know if we will or, or what's the final going to say, but I'm confident we're going to get this one. <laughs> so 
Uh, so we always try. We, you know, we, we, we know we've got to do this initial education and that's tough because I'm not, you know, this is a tiny part of my job too. <laughs> I'm no expert. So all of a sudden you have the blind leading the blind a little bit. Um, that's kind of how I was going to talk about lead and in, in the commercial side of building new buildings that, that get a lot of light and then a lot of exterior lights and then go for this light pollution credit. Now I have 40 other buildings that are already exist and on those I'm doing lighting replacements typically every year. We're, we're, we have so many buildings that by the time I finish or I, I can come back around and start redoing them. So I'm going to talk a lot about exterior uh, lighting retrofits uh, as well. First a quick little intro and I'm going to Maybe check my time. Sorry if I I can go uh, not over. Okay. So in our district, we're really transparent about how much we spend. So these are the real numbers over this time period. I didn't update it from a previous conversation because it's not really that relevant to be exact. But you know, we're we're spending certainly real money every month on our utility bill just for electricity and. We do little analysis, you know, if I just draw this line, I say, okay, well, that, that upslope of, of energy use in the summertime, that, that's what we spend on cooling. Okay. And then everything else down below that line, that's the money we spent on our plug loads, our lighting. Um, and I think if I were to sort of estimate a back of the envelope, I would say we, we easily spend over a million dollars uh, just on exterior lighting every year. So if I can save money in the exterior lighting, it, it's, it's real money that I, that I can save. I mean, often I can replace a fixture that's 80% more efficient than what I had before. So, um, you know, I can't translate that to saving $800,000 in a year because it would take me way too long and there's drivers and stuff. But I, I do end up saving thousands of dollars per month per building every time we do one of these projects so just the the motivation is there and the and the payback time frame is there as well often when i'm pitching something they'll say well what's the return on the investment and acc thankfully doesn't have a hard and fast rule about well it has to be less than five years but even if they did all of these exterior airline projects are two to three three years so they're they're very quick payback projects, the fastest I have. In fact, everyone will say exterior lighting is the low hanging fruit for, for my job for energy management. So having said that, I'm gonna kind of move on like, oh yeah, a million, one million dollars is what is what I think I can save us every year. Um, so like I said, it's, it's, it's called low hanging fruit because the paybacks are so fast and I'm taking metal halide or some other kind of, of older light and, and replacing it often saving 80 percent and that is kind of i'm just repeating what i just said but that next point is they also last about five times as long so now i'm saving on maintenance too we do all our own maintenance we have in-house electricians and everything and they, they drive around we have whole crews to do it so that's very valuable to us as well just uh, on the maintenance side it's a little bit more difficult to quantify as we begin to transition, it'll be easier for me to see what we're, we're really doing in practice. I found that we, we're not getting what the manufacturers say we're gonna get in terms of terms of life, but that's neither here nor there because really what I wanna talk about is LEDs, as I put them in, have incredible capabilities now to reduce the light trespass and, and vertical illuminance com compared to what we've had in the past. So just in the past, I think, two years I've done these campuses and for those of you that are uh, not familiar with ACC I'll translate uh, SAC SAC is our South Austin campus EVC is Eastview campus SVC is where my office is at the service center and um, that's just one little building where the electricians and the HVAC people are and then RRC is our Round Rock campus and so the Round Rock campus is, is really large and so I, I broke it into halves uh, to give you some scope on each half of the project, it's about $100,000 to $150,000 per half to, to, uh, to retrofit the lights on the campus. So, so my projects are fairly large. Um, Eastview is even bigger than that. We broke it into three or four sections. Uh, 
So these, these are what I kind of think of as large lighting retrofit projects. And I'm gonna go through some photos. So the first one is, is gonna talk about this light trespass. So um, on commercial projects, we always get these photometrics maps. This is just like a little clip of the Round Rock campus. And it, it might be really hard to see for those of you uh, on tablets and everything, I apologize for that, but I thought I'd show it anyway. The green lines are a certain type of, of head and head shape in the, in the LEDs that we're using. And it shows the projection of, of where it's gonna be illuminated on the ground so that we can Co cover our territory and then the orange lines are the same thing but it's a different type of light so the orange lights are our walkway lights and the green ones are our parking lot lights and that's what you're seeing here and this is kind of what we look at um, some of them will be circles like there's an orange kind of circular thing here but others will be different shapes and that's where i'm going here that the, these commercial leds come with changeable configurations so that you can make different shapes in the light and um, this is kind of the, the light that we're sort of talking about. I, I, we use a lot, but I just threw this one cut sheet in as an example. They look like this, you know, they're, they're flat on top and they kind of project down. So that's, that's better. But then how they, uh, oh, sorry, I should mention this while I'm here. I'm glad I reminded myself. Uh, they're also not just tunable in shape, but they're also tunable in their color temperature. And I'm gonna talk about that some more too. And as I get back to my written standard, don't let me forget. Uh, right, going on with this shape, right? They're configurable in their throw shapes. And so you can really plot how you want, uh, where you want to have light and where you want to have dark. And for example, at our South Austin campus, it's kind of integrated in the neighborhood a little bit more than maybe some of the, the others that are more commercially located. But we built this parking garage up and it's really tall. It's taller than all the neighbors and there's apartments like just over the fence line. And so if we light up the top of our garage, right, it was also just throwing light into the upper levels of, of these apartments. And so our neighbors were always mad, they would, they would complain. So part of our, our retrofit on the South Austin campus was to just kind of like draw a line of darkness at our, at our property line and say, we're, we're not going to trespass light at all. We're going to just keep the light where we need it and, and return darkness back to those apartment dwellers. And, and they love it. It's, it's so much uh, better for them and in, in living in those spaces now. And they, they've been much happier for, for us having done it, but we enabled, we're enabled to do this because, you know, a traditional light might've just thrown a circle, kind of a dumb light. But LED light, we can pick one that's got a really straight kind of kind of line and, and build on our property line as, as we put the poles up. So, so I think it's just fantastic. Um, it's gonna be difficult. These next two are before and afters of, of Round Rock and you really aren't gonna be able to see all that well from my photos. This one is uh, the after. It's It's been done, so these are uh, pole mounted LEDs and the light is, is super clear for the experts in the room. They can probably already tell the color temperature because it's, it's pretty bluish. Um, this is a 4000K, if I, if I went back here. Uh, you know, they come in the, in the 3000, 4000, 5000K. When I got here, we were doing 5000 as our, as our standard. Just do a 5000K, the security people wanted clarity and, and, and the, the thought was this bluest light is, is going to be the most clear for the cameras. So I talked them down to 4,000 K and we've adopted that as our standard across the board. I don't think I'm ever going to be able to talk them into 3,000, but at least we're in the middle and I'd love to hear more feedback about what you guys think now. And the other thing is I'd like to collect motivation to maybe get to 3,000 someday, if you even think that's better. So this is kind of one of our, every, all our pregnant lots are empty right now. It's, it's sad. This is a before. It's, it's much shadowy. It's, there are more shadows. And uh, there's also a lot more up light, which is, is very difficult to see. Um, and I don't necessarily know a great way, because, of course, with my camera, I can't pick up the fixture itself unless I go there while the fixture is off. But to me, this kind of after photo feels 
much more open and safer than sort of the the darker and older, but it's also only using about 20% of the energy. So I'm gonna move off of our round arc project. This is that South Austin garage that I was talking about. And we did all the floors of the garage as well as the rooftop and the exterior parking lots and the walkways. So like right now we're looking down and you can see the walkway lights are, are, are you know, they're black from up here. They're just sending light down. So, so we're trying to meet dark sky objectives in that manner. In, on this project, we actually had to calculate reflectivity of the, of the pavement too. Um, but I don't want to digress too far. What I was going to say about this project is it's the only project that we've been able to talk them into dimming. Um, I think one of your principles is, is only use light when you need it. Well, we run lights all the time, we run 24 seven, right? It, it, all night. Uh, they do turn off in the daytime, but they don't turn off ever <laughs> at night. And our campuses really don't close for that long. Uh, we, we have a small window where we close. I think it's open to students from 6 a.m. to maybe midnight or 1 a.m. So, that, so our, our open to the public window it is super large. And then we have staff that come in even from midnight to 6 a.m. So there's going to be people there, generally speaking. But if there's not anyone on the, the, the roof or the, the fourth, third, second floor of the garage, et cetera, then those lights actually will motion dim to just 10%. We, we have them tuned to be able to go down to 10% of their maximum value. And they never go up to 100%, right? Because with dimmable lights, we were able to uh, get people out there and say, okay, so tell, tell us when it's as, as bright as you want it, right? And, and, and I don't think we ever go above 80% on the light. So, so dimming helps in, in many ways. It helps us, uh, first off, just use less energy all the time with the maximum being under 100%. And then it helps us when it's unoccupied to really just stage the light back and, and to 10%. This light is so clear that even at 10%, you, you can see everything. Uh, it's great. And because it's motion detected, actually, if you just walk through, like they'll, they'll ramp up as you, as you come. It's a, it's an interesting effect. And I think it's worked really well. The issue here was uh, preventative maintenance. It's really difficult to test these lamps. The dimmers make it hard for people to just turn on all the lamps in a, in a different way to, to make sure that it's not burned out. And we don't have electricians that work at night, so no one drives around. Like many uh, higher education, they, they have a night crew that actually goes around and checks lights at night. We don't. We don't have anyone checking at night. So all of our preventative maintenance, PMing, is done by someone going there during the day and turning on the light. And because this became a problem with preventative maintenance, I never got dimming again, the same crew. Now, our 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 supervisor in the electrical department just retired and, and he was kind of our main blocker and I would never say a bad word about him. He's totally fantastic and we're much worse off for having him retire. The one area where, where he was blocking me though is in these dimming fixtures. So I'm hopeful I'll be able to return to dimming fixtures in the future. This is an example where we, ACC loves their waves. I think I have another picture of a building with a wave on it. But this awning, when it was built by the architect, had all these uplights on top of it too, right? If you can just imagine the wave kind of shining up on the side of the building, that's what it used to do. And when we did the retrofit, we retired all of the uplights. And uh, you know, we don't tell the original architect or anything. So if they drive by, maybe they'll get mad. But right now, we've uh, we've got it going with with no uplighting and. Um, I think it. I think it looks great, and I think it's safe. I think it's met all of our our safety and our energy expectations, as well as our aesthetics. So, um, so I think it's it's good, and and we're making progress. Yeah. So this is the building where I work. This is service center, and you can see we painted that wave along the side of the wall. This this is a non pole mounted light setup. So all of our lights are building mounted. And they have these really long throws because the building's tall. But you can see how clearly the, the walk is being lit and 
the good news there is it's, we, we can kind of confine it to just the walk and so that field behind it will actually remain in, in relative at least darkness and um I, I can't see it in this photo but off to the left of the photo there's like a creek that runs in a, another pasture across the creek and that's all just pitch black so uh, and, and this is one that I had to build in the non dimming era or or otherwise this this one would probably dim because it's a center and not a campus it's actually closed for more hours this, this one could have stayed dimmed for a really 12 hours a night probably but uh i, I didn't win that battle and uh i'm, I'm just glad I, I did win the the other retrofitting kind of battles so this is kind of where i get to my ask and, and i hope that we can have a little discussion about it because you know i need you to educate me i i have failings that i'm totally willing to admit and i need to know how to get better at my job when i was reading through the ida website and everything a lot of it is individual focused and i'm you know obviously focusing on our commercial facilities so so i need education that's very commercial and uh, and, and applies to that standard and then you know i talked about the difficulties with lead and how complex it is i'm hoping that if we all kind of get together about that same complexity maybe there's a way to simplify it or uh, maybe there's just a guide that is a simpler flow chart the language in in lead is, is it, it's too referenced i've got to have all these other sources constantly and I, I can't just describe anything to a person sitting down in front of me there's no executive summary let's say and then what do I recommend? You know, I, I don't have bullet point best practices for this one point, um, nor do I really have them for my buildings as I go in and talk to a lighting designer or whoever I um, kind of struggle on a building by building basis to come up with what I want to do. And then, you know, I've told you we changed our color temperature and, and we're doing all 4,000 across the district. But honestly, maybe that's maybe it's not good enough. Maybe it's not not what we should be doing. So I need some feedback and and to know the recommendation. The other thing is, a lot of the information does doesn't apply in our area, right? There's no baby sea turtles in Austin. So what can I do for Central Texas to say, you know, this is the wildlife, for example, that it, it's going to be affected, and is, is there a is, is there something really Austin focused? Uh, and I think that's going to be work for all all of your territories, right? There's going to be some builders out there that's going to need this this kind of local knowledge. So that that's a lot of work to do, but I think it's how we make a dent and and do the the convincing for the builders. Um, so that's really my prepared topics, and and it'll be easy for you to contact me. So actually, I'll just go back to to this slide and and hope that that can frame our conversation. But it doesn't at all have to you know feel free to ask me whatever it is that that you want to ask so from here i'm gonna um turn it back over <laughs> thank you um i i so appreciate your and i'm sure everybody else does your perspective on this and the issues that you brought up and i think there are a number of us that can um can help with that so um, I, um, Debbie has raised her hand, Debbie Moran. And um, bef before she starts, I will mention that um, there are at least a couple of us who have been <clears throat> concentrated on the commercial side. Great, um, yeah. I have done, yeah, um, commercial reviews and uh, for years. And um, I think that, that it would be good my initial thought is that it would be good if we got our um, a couple of people from our Tucson office involved and let them hear what you have to say, and and we look at at getting lead <clears throat> um, changes done from a national level. Yeah, absolutely. The, the... Yeah. yeah. So. so, Debbie, did you have a question? Yeah, so, um, so in Houston, we've been working on the lighting here also, and first of all, your designs look beautiful as far as um, the design of the light and shining it where you want it, and really happy to use, hear that you're using dimming. The people we're working with are Dr. Mario Mata, who co-wrote the American Medical Association um, guidelines recommending 3,000K or less. 
um, Chris Lukenbuhl and Flagstaff point out the problem, and I mentioned this in my talks, is the problem is the shorter wavelength of, um, of say, 4000K or the wider colors, even when it's pointed downward, the problem for us is that it's, because of the short wavelength, it scatters quite a bit more in the atmosphere. So that can still spread quite a bit more into the night sky than a warmer color. And I was wondering if I could share my screen. We have very little warm LED light in Houston, but we have a very few <laughs> examples on my website. Is it possible for me to share my screen? I have them open. I, I can uh, stop sharing. Let me, let me just stop. Um, and I have permission, Cindy? Let me try. Okay, let me see if I can uh, more open. Uh, here it is. Okay, so this is um, this is a Denny's I just discovered in West Houston, and um, the photo on the right actually is what it looks like to look directly at the LEDs. And part of that is just that the color is more comfortable to look at. So given the same wattage of warmer colors, going to be less harsh on the eye, and it's going to scatter less in the eye and the atmosphere. And then if I scroll up, the very first warm LEDs I saw on a walkway or at Rice University. This picture on the right is at Rice University. And again, you can look directly at the array of LEDs without it hurting your eyes at all. And then we also have found that at some of the shell stations, again, they have warmer, we think these are all probably 3000K LEDs. And again, because of the color, you can see the array of the LEDs without it hurting your eyes. And so this is one step better in the scatter and the uh, lighting engineers I've been talking to Chris Monrad in, in Tucson and James Benyon Davis say that between warm white and 4000K, you really have basically the same efficiency, the same visibility. So you don't necessarily have to ramp up the wattage, say to use the 3000K versus 4000K to see just as well, but yet this would be a little bit more night sky friendly. So I just wanted to show you what some of these examples look like in Houston, Texas. And these are the very few I could find most of our lighting is white and uh, we have terrible light pollution here in Houston because um, everything whether it's pointed downward or outward is white. So I just right. want to show and, you and some examples. The white ones that are you know 4000 K anything above 3000 K even 3000 K causes more scatter as Debbie said but it's in the back of the eye too which means it causes more glare and it makes it more difficult for people to see. And um, I know I've, I have gotten recently some um, 2400K bulbs, uh, LEDs to look at, and it's so easy on the eye. You can see better and you, you get almost the color rendition. So the, the lower Kelvin not only is healthier for you, but um, you, can, you can see better and it causes less scatter into the atmosphere. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if, I, if I pulled my cut sheet back up, you, you, you could see, right? That's, that's not even in the offering. Uh, right? ah, but the same company that you went with, Lithonia, offers yeah. a little bit different um, fixture that is, and actually the Lithonia, I'd be willing to bet if you ask them, um, they offer the 2700 Kelvin. Yeah, so one, one of the points we make with the warmer light is it's not just what you see under the light where it's actually hitting on the ground, the warmer light helps you see where it's less well lit, better than the white light does. So we see fantastically well under your lighting, but say the areas around the school that don't have lights on them will be more difficult to see when the eyes adjusted to the white light than with a warmer light. Correct. So, it's, so you end up getting an overall better visibility. I, I think it's supposed, it's sort of a trade-off. So the shorter wavelength really does make things look more crisp but at night it makes the darker areas more invisible. So it's, you're trying to hit a balance between those two. Yeah, and, and making sure that the security cameras are not, not, not affected, right? That's, right, that's right. The, the first question I'm gonna give is, well, how's it gonna look on camera? Because that's- it, it's like, exactly. You know, there's a, the Ring, the Ring a webcam said that they use 3000K for best video. And we've had, if there's any white light pointed at a camera, we were actually called to some uh, apartments and they were, this is white light pointed outward, unlike yours, but they were, their um, security cameras were blinded by someone else's white light. Um, so uh, someone told me, I'm not an expert in this, that um, too much white can actually sort of blow out the cameras. So, so they, it's almost 
almost too much brightness for them to get the detail. So there's, that probably also requires a balance. But I don't know much about amber and security cameras. Maybe, maybe Cindy knows a little bit more. Yeah, I don't know about the amber, but when, but 2700, you know, 24 to 2700 Kelvin, um, the cameras that I've seen, you, you know, picking up um, details from that has been very clear. And I know that, um, for instance, we have a school in our district that, um, on the original cut sheets, Lithonia had 3,000, you know, and up, and they went back um, because we were asking for lower um, Kelvin ratings. They went back and they said, oh yeah, we've got 2,700, no problem. It may take- Oh, that's interesting that they may, hadn't put it on the cut sheet. Yeah, yeah, it may, they said it may take us, you know, a week, maybe two weeks longer in a, in a eight to 10 week process to, to put those out, you know, produce them for you. But um, the the new school is going in with everything 2,700 Kelvin. Right, and Jim Benia told me that's one thing a lot of people don't know. He said to tell the city here is that often uh, the company can provide a color temperature that's not on their spec sheets. And it's just a matter of asking for it. Yeah. And another thing, I know, and, and I could probably dig through it and find the, um, school, but there are big universities that um, use timers and motion textures, just cut off the lights like in the parking lots that aren't being used or parking garages. And if uh, motion detectors turn on the lights, then security people know, hmm, we need to go over there and check on that, <laughs> that, it, that it actually helped the security people. Yeah, we've heard that from our South Austin police so that they can tell when the garage ramps up a little bit from, from where they're in the building looking at the garage. And, and yeah. It's a good clue for them. Yeah, um, yeah. Yep. And we, we have this, the same system that the city of Austin uses for its external light. We, we have lighting control for our exterior lighting called Rome. That's not really a pitch. It's just what Central Texas uses. And so, yeah, with the switch of a button, I mean, I could turn the district off. And, yeah. and we never do it. We yeah. don't. Like and, um, I was energy manager at Texas Tech University before I was at Austin Community College and th they have tunable light all over and they can use their lighting design to, to, to turn lights off and, and they do in, in certain areas that they, they have kind of darker regions that they allow to, to go off and in fact we would do kind of a, an event where we showed off the capability of our, of our lighting controls by having kind of fun runs at night where we could you know light the next pole and then that, yeah. that's and like orienteering you, like, you just run follow the light. following the lights and yeah. it, it's a fun event and ACC certainly could do things like that but we we don't have the same yeah. level of <laughs> permission yeah. a couple people have put in the chat um talking about um amphibians fireflies um birds species of bats impacted negatively by all the lights, especially the ones in, you know, that are above 3000 Kelvin. But I was gonna say that almost every living thing on this planet is negatively affected by blue light at night. And- well, I mean, we are the river bats, that's our- Yeah, so- <laughs> That's our mascot, so, so bats maybe is where I need to bats go. Bats maybe Aust is the Austin one you need, yeah. Bats. Yeah, and we can hook you up with, um, experts on on bats um and gordon also made note that when security cameras first came out all the lighting was 2700 um high pressure sodium and nobody had any problems and i'd flag staff um arizona they all have a low pressure sodium which is even um which is pretty close to amber and um we have contacts out there, but I don't think they have any problems with security cameras out there either. So right, I mean, at, at Eastview, that's that's what we had, and and the lights. If you took your handheld camera out there and took a photo, it would come out just orange, just pure pure orange. Pure orange. And it's it's a uh, it looks uh, otherworldly. In fact, so I have oh, some I photos that are kind of unusable. But yeah, I mean, you're using the cameras in that orange light, and then you're still requiring me to go, you know. Yeah, pretty, pretty far on the into the white spectrum. Uh, yeah, when, when I replaced them, which it kind of made no <laughs> no sense to me. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but but it is. I mean, I, 
And then again at, at South Austin with the dimming to 10%, they, they can still see everything even at, at 10% of the light. It's really amazing because of course the security cameras are, are smart enough to be able to well, absolutely. widen that aperture, right? So and and that, that, I mean, think about what's that saying. That's saying that you really don't need, you know, 80 to 90% of the light that's out there that people can, the way the human eye works, they can see with less. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, and getting, but getting that to be policy is, is another thing. So I, I've got all these one-off campuses where I'm piecing together something. Uh, but I, I, I so appreciate you bringing this perspective and, and um, I, I would, I think that there are a number of things that, that um, people in this group can, can help supply some good information for you and, and so that you can take it to you know the people who do say yeah this is exactly what we're going to do and cindy and i have a question changes yeah cindy yeah uh, this is frank cronin i am uh, am at austin community college with caleb so this right. is my question to caleb caleb you mentioned earlier that you would really like to get down to the three thousand k in the lighting but that probably wouldn't happen so i wonder if you have done any outreach with some academic programs at ACC like environmental sciences and astronomy to see if they could get on board and help you accomplish some of the things you'd like to do at school. Yeah, the, the astronomy club actually meets at Round Rock. Yeah. And, and so that was my hope was that we'd be able to really leverage them, but it didn't work out. Um, so it, it, 2020 is an odd year. Maybe it would have worked better in any other year. Uh, but right well, now, you know, we, we're, we're kind of doing this retrofit and nobody's there. Like my, my contractors are saying, well, when, when can we go to campus? And I say, anytime you want. <laughs> There's no, no one there. So they don't have to worry about closing parking lots this year and all that. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I, we did reach out to the uh, astronomy club at Round Rock. Which, which is our whole district-wide club leadership there, but we didn't get any uh, any support on the project. And I, yeah, you know where we are with purchasing. Mm -hmm. it, it's difficult to to purchase anything, let alone something that's a right. change. So, well, um, Caleb, a couple years ago, I got in touch with the chair of the astronomy department, offering to come do presentations on light pollution, and they wouldn't work with me. So I had the same experience you did yeah. I'm not sure why yeah, that would help honestly. to work with people um, about light pollution in in your area I just don't understand that because I have you know I'm in facilities with all these project managers that are building buildings right so for on the new construction side I could do a lunch and learn you know for you guys to come to come in or and and you know our our project managers would RSVP or not if they're interested but we could give them you know an hour of of continuing ed kind of credit they they have a requirement you know through ACCHR to uh, to learn things and <laughs> this is one of the areas where if I brought in an expert I could potentially host something and probably you guys are better suited to give that presentation than like our astronomy club as it as it turns out mm -hmm. hey, Caleb uh, I have a comment or maybe a, a something that can help out I'm involved in the ACC GIS program I don't know if you guys know anybody in the GIS program there, but uh, mm -hmm. one of the students that I had classes with a couple of years ago did a capstone project on light pollution in Sunset Valley. And um, she mapped it and it was really interesting. And I, I kept seeing a GIS um, tie in to what you were showing. And I feel like that the geography communities really interdisciplinary and they're a really great place. They're, they're really great people that run the GIS program, first of all, but um, I think they would be interesting to, to partner with or talk to and collaborate with. So if you want yeah. the contacts, let me know. That's interesting because we haven't really talked to them, but uh, Laura, I guess, Chapa, uh, Chapa is, is a friend of mine and has come to sustainability conferences with us. And of course, she's uh, GIS. And then I, I, I've taken GIS from, from Stephanie, Stephanie Long. So, oh, yeah, me too. Yeah. Right. So, so we, you know, but no, I haven't really talked to them about this, right? Because, you know, we do, 
500 things. So, um, in fact, Laura was asking me for a, for a project that we could partner in. So, yeah, maybe send me an email about that idea because I think they're, you're right. I think there are people within ACC that would have the skills and time and, and desire to, to help. Caleb, do you have funding available to do a demonstration project with some of the lights that you would prefer using on a section someplace? Yeah, we love pilots. And, and if I could get a pilot project, I think I think I could win, right? Because I think if we had an area where they would let me do that pilot, the money Just, is not the issue. So yes, yeah. we have the money. A but, demonstration of some, the, the type of light that everybody seems to think would be better for the coverage and and do the job yes if i could pilot 2700 somewhere with security cameras that needed to be safe for students and then get student and faculty feedback on it yeah i think that is i think that's the silver bullet so to speak um because i'm confident that the 2700 lights would, would pass um, so far i don't have any place where i can can do a pilot that's not to say we won't the, there's a lot of places and, and what it takes maybe at, at our organization is, is we, we have campus managers and if it were in a retrofit situation a campus manager would have to volunteer now south austin is is always super gung-ho to do anything sustainable and eastview campus is is both of those have already had lighting retrofits so i have to find somebody else and that's a great idea laura yeah yeah, we're trying, we're trying to figure out where we can do a pilot program up here in Alpine. So, yeah. uh, Caleb, um, what's the retro uh, fitting situation at Northridge campus? Well, Northridge has kind of first year LEDs already. So the, the technology within LEDs already has improved so much that the payback for replacing Northridge campus would be quick. But it probably wouldn't be two to three years, but it would be five to six. And, and I'm sure I could, you know, get a five to six year payback pushed through in our purchasing. So that probably could happen. But um, we have maybe like five or six other campuses that are that are worse off than, than yours. <laughs> so, so, so it's not on my near term list. Um, Gordon has a question, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, uh, actually, Caleb, you and I are kind of in professionally in related fields. Uh, I'm the residential construction specialist here in Denton for um, HUD funded um, housing projects. And uh, so uh, yeah, I, I've actually, uh, about five years ago, did a, um, put together a PowerPoint presentation. I gave it the Building Professionals Institute um, in Arlington. and um, talk to architects, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I really want to take the message to, to architects and that's the, and, and I, I see your, your problem because uh, lighting is always like the last thing that, they, that ends up on the plans and it's usually installed at the very end when money is tight. So, you know, project managers start cutting it. I have a specific question though, on those, uh, those Lithonia lights, do, is there a possibility that they can, well, one thing you said, they're tunable. Uh, do they have to come from the factory that way? I mean, when you, um, uh, the, the light throw, you, you can't change that light throw by a computer from your office. No, or no. the color temperature. They, right. They, they come with so those. That's, so that's set. that's set at a factory, like I thought. Yeah. Now, some of them uh, come with a, um, an aftermarket, uh, of, you can install grids, that uh, that actually act as shields at each led phosphor is kind of nestled in its own little grid have you have you seen any of those or spec any of those that would tend to shift the light it would tend to um give you a um uh, a glare z of close to zero you know that, that, the bug rating. 300 that particular um light offers a 360 degree glare shield, which is right, okay. what we use quite often in this area. Yeah. yeah. We have done some of that. It just yeah. depends on okay. you know, how much throw they need in a space. Yeah. Great discussion, y'all. 
Any other questions? Discussion points? So Caleb, during the last six months of the pandemic, when too many people are not on campus, has that changed the use of lighting? Unfortunately, it hasn't changed the use of much of anything. Yeah. Um, as part of my job, I, I do what we call utility reports. So I give every campus manager and who, any stakeholder that's uh, remotely interested, <laughs> that will anyone who will read my document, I give it to. And the campus by campus, I look at you know what happened in fiscal year 20, which is the report I'm writing now. We, we can clearly see, you know, the change in March because we evacuated spring break and never came back. And uh, one of the things I wanted to do immediately, this is deviating from lighting, I apologize, but I was change the, the HVAC settings to unoccupied, right? These campuses are closed. I mean, we, we have signs on the door that say this building is not open to the public anymore. So to me, that is unoccupied. But there were, uh, you know, two or three police officers that came and essential personnel like a campus manager. There might have been four staff in a building that normally would have hundreds. But no, we didn't change our temperature settings at all in any, in any building. And that, that's, to me, was a real problem. But it, back in March, we thought, well, it'll be a couple of weeks, and then in mm -hmm. April, surely it'll end. And it just always is, you know, about to end. And, and finally, you know, they said, well, we're not coming back until Christmas. They actually kind of still formally said, maybe we're supposed to return to work um, in January. But I am fully expecting an announcement to say, no, stay at home at this point. So anyway, it's a long way to say, we really didn't change anything. We didn't change the light settings. And we have campuses in the corridors, for example, that burn 24 seven, that, that don't have any motion sensing or dimming at all. And then we have other campuses that are, have just been off. Yeah. And, and because they do have motion detectors and, and motion in every room. Some campuses are switch driven, some campuses are, are, are motion. And so, some don't have switches at all, they're just always on. So no one has made any kind of like concerted effort uh, about, you know, with regard to the pandemic to reduce energy. That being said, we still did reduce energy because the heating loads of thousands of students in a building is considerable. We didn't have to heat for any of that and the doors don't open and close as much. So we have saved energy, but nothing on the lighting side that I can say really at all, other than the, about half our campuses that are full motion detection, interior, exterior, only South Austin has motion detection. Caleb, from the teaching side, we are already thinking about summer semester, and our understanding, even though there's not been a formal announcement, is that we're going to be teaching online in the summer, and that's what we're gearing for. Same in my department, too. We, uh, the facilities and operations departments are way behind <laughs> academic, just temporally, and how they start doing their thinking that way. And that the academic departments, you know, they got to plan way, way in advance of us. So I sit in on our, our department planning meetings because I'm a government professor too. So um, yeah, all of our government classes are 100% online in the spring and then probably will be the same in the summer. So my, my expectation too. Uh, does that mean I can change the settings? It still doesn't mean that. We did have a vice president on the operations side who changed the thermostat settings in May, which was actually pretty good. I mean, March, April, May. So, so it's not that we change. I wanted to change them to unoccupied settings, but he just raised the occupied setting. Um, so kind of two ways of accomplishing this the same thing. So he, he, he gained us some savings by doing that district wide. And I'm sure no one noticed because there's no one there. <laughs> But, but as far as like my job goes, well, well I have to return as, as staff and that, that decision hasn't been made as far as I know. So I, I have a question about color and, and just from a purely aesthetic standpoint, um, I'm kind of under the impression, this is my porch light is 2700K, that 3000K has sort of a yellow look, whereas 2700K is more golden. And I think part of your problem is getting, if we go to a warmer color, is the aesthetics of it. And I'm wondering, maybe Cindy knows, just if people were just to look at, the, at, at warm lighting, what would they just find most pleasant from, especially any place like a campus where they need to see well, 
as far as just from a purely aesthetic standpoint. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I suspect it is part of it is what they've been told. <clears throat> if they think they need um, daylight white to be able to see well and don't realize how their eye actually works at night, then they may say, oh, I like that better. It's whiter. It's, you know, but, um, you know, okay. they really understand that they can see beyond the lit area when, when you start getting rid of that light in the blue wavelength, then, you know, they would prefer that. So I, I, I think part of it is education and experience there, not, yeah. not yeah. something across the board. I think the manufacturers haven't done us any favors there, not to blame anyone, but the quest for really white light <laughs> it took, took many years for, for the LED lighting quality to just get up there. And, and once they got there, they're really proud of it. So they want to sell it. Well, so, the, so everybody's kind of been told, like, you need the 5,000, 5,000. So like, well, that's sure. because those, were, those were the first ones they made, were the very bright white. <clears throat> and, and they were the cheapest ones for a long time. So for a long time, it costs more to, to have them in a lower Kelvin, but it doesn't cost any more now. So they were um, you know, telling people, this is what you need. If it helps, there is a YouTube video that's after the installation of Phoenix's um, 2700K light. She can't really see the lighting that well, but one of the city council members comes on early on and she says, people look better in Phoenix than in other cities. <laughs> So they clearly feel like they have a better aesthetic street light system using the 2700K instead of 4000. And they actually stopped mid installation and uh, switched from 4000K to 2700K, but they were just smiling broadly. And they said they were so happy they listened to their community that they look better than other cities. So my guess is that we, I feel like we, need, I haven't, still haven't seen just what a street looks like looking down the street a long way, say uh, uh, with 2700K, I've seen individual street lights. I feel like if we could get an images out there, we might have people just say, gee, this looks beautiful, we would like this. And um, you know, that, that, something like that might help, but they clearly feel like they look, that they are happy with. That's something that restaurants have known for a long time. Uh, uh, I, I... Whenever I have a conversation with somebody about lighting, I always have to say this, the human eye is a funny thing. And um, the, um, the, the, the human eye is hardwired because of our uh, system of rods and cones in our retina. In the daylight, we use our cones uh, to see motion and we're used to the incredibly bright bluish you know, uh, light. But then at night, we're, we're pretty much hardwired to see by like firelight, like our ancestors did for millions of years. And, and so I find that an amber, like bug lights, you know, 2200, turtle lights, some people call them 2200 Kelvin uh, lights at night are much more pleasing to my eye. You know, and, unless I'm in a car lot trying to figure out what color a car is. And, and boy, that's the reason car dealers use like 7000 K uh, lights to, to light their parking lots. Um, you know, I, I think people just don't know really, you know, that, that they don't need that, that uh, daylight lighting at night. Um, that they're, that, uh, that's just, it's unnatural. The human eye is actually a, a fine device. So it's kind of odd in, in some ways and, and, and that we're used to that amber light at night and um, it's more natural. And I think and the older you get, like like me, um, uh, the 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 uh, the higher uh, CCT lights very glary. You know, um, yeah. it, it messes with the reflective coating on my glasses. Um, and anything much lower, twenty seven hundred and twenty two hundred, is, is very appealing, uh, much easier on the eye, and I can see just fine to get around. Yeah. There is, I've seen one car lot in Houston. I've I got to go back up there. It's pretty far away from us. But we were driving down I-45 and there's like a sea of white glare. And all of a sudden there was this golden glow over one car lot. And it was actually an upscale car lot. It was an Audi Northwest. Huh. And uh, just, it, it, was, it looked like an oasis compared to everything else. 
It was beautiful. Probably, probably some was German lighting engineers light. that made him do that. <laughs> it, anyway, it was nice looking. It looked. It was a pretty golden so, light. Well, thank you guys very much. I'm, I'm glad I got to have a discussion and it's been really helpful to me. Uh, like I said, feel free to contact us. If, if you wanna just contact ACC generally and talk to sustainability folks, we're the color green at austincc.edu. Uh, otherwise, I, I, I put my email address in the presentation, which will be recorded, but it's caleb.crow at austincc.edu. We are so glad you were here. Yes, thank you very much. Thank I love that you guys do this advocacy. Uh, I, I need to get more involved myself.